This conference will now be recorded. All right, thanks everybody. My name is Penny Carroll. I've met some of you. I recognize some faces um, from the classes. And I'm the public affairs specialist dedicated to the New Lock Project. I'm a former Air Force public affairs officer. I spent about 15 years down at Selfridge Air National Guard Base as the PAO for the base in a deployment to Afghanistan. And I've been with the Corps of Engineers only since January. So the project is uh, very new to me, but it's so very exciting and I'm just thrilled to be part of the project. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a designer, but I'm quickly becoming a, a lock enthusiast and boat. So thanks for joining in with us today. So we'll kind of just, I'll start at the beginning with a little bit of history and then move into the project. Um, We'll start at the St. Mary's River, which is the only water connecting Lake Superior to the other Great Lakes. And this, uh, this drops about 21 feet over only about three quarters of a mile span. Early French explorers and fur traders and others moving goods through the system ran into problems because of the rapids. In fact, they used to have to unload cargo and carry it around the rapids. And then in 1798, to support the growing fur trade, the Northwest Fur Company built a canoe lock on the north shore of the river. And this lock was approximately 40 feet long and nine feet wide. In um, 1843, Michigan's copper boom up in the Western UP, transportation becomes really critical as the mines need to get their copper downstate and supplies upstate. So if it weren't for the locks, major ports like Marquette and Duluth Superior would be inaccessible to the rest of the Great Lakes. So portaging ships in both directions became very labor intensive. Um, you can see on this picture the tram that's built. So as they unload, um, unload from the ship, then they can tram it up, train it up to the other side, and then have to put it back on a ship to go the other way. And then again, supplies and cargo going one way or the other towards Superior or out of St. Superior. So for almost 200 years after the French first came to the area, portaging really was the only way to bypass the rapids. And eventually the state would construct locks. Um, as in 1853, the Michigan legislature approved a project. Built in only two years at a cost of $1 million, this tandem lock used two chambers, each measuring 350 feet by 70 feet and each with a lift of about 10 feet to bypass the rapids. And this was owned and operated by the state of Michigan. But by the 1870s, it was clear that the operation of the lock at the Sioux was of national significance and the state of Michigan passed legislation to turn it over to the federal government. Although it would be several years before the federal government formally accepted ownership and management of the facility, Congress began appropriating funds to build a new larger lock. And this lock, eventually named the Wheatville Lock, was 515 feet long, 80 feet wide, and 17 feet deep. And it had a lift of 20 feet. Unlike the state lock, which filled and emptied through sluices in the gates, this lock filled and emptied through openings in the floor, reducing the turbulence in the lock. So every lock built at the Sioux since then has used this innovation. Um, Upon completion of this lock, that's when it was uh, formally turned over to the federal government and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has operated and maintained the locks ever since. Within 10 years uh, of that, the locks in the Sioux have proven to be of regional economic importance and it was recommended that another lock be built. So the Corps of Engineers General Orlando Poe took responsibility for this project since newer ships being built couldn't pass the Sioux fully loaded, this new lock would be deeper, wider, and longer, which is something that we've seen since they started building locks there. It was built on the site of the former state lock, and the original pole was 800 feet long and 100 feet wide. In the early years of the 20th century, boat sizes began to push the limits of the pole's capacity. So originally designed to lock up to four vessels at a time, by 1905, boats were about 570 feet long and had to be locked through one at a time. And to cut down on delays and to handle more than uh, one boat at a time, a plan was developed to build 
a new lock that was uh, 1,350 feet long, 80 feet wide, and 24 feet deep. At 1350, this Davis lock held the honor of being like the longest lock in the world when it opened. But then an exact replica, an exact twin of the Davis lock was built, the Sabin lock, even before the Davis was finished. It's the only lock um, on our site that's named for a civilian, Louis Sabin, and the only civilian to ever serve as the Detroit district engineer. The Sabin and Davis locks were built using the same exact specifications and plans. And I just think that it's so really cool that these locks, even since the um, early 1800s, the innovation is so amazing. And we think that all of that was done before the 1920s when these sorts of things had, had yet to be created, the toaster, the recliner, the Band-Aid. So I just think that's really kind of cool. The MacArthur lock then, um, we've got three newer locks in operation. The Weetzel is um, relatively shallow and is not really used after about 1919. Um, by 1936, the channels have uh, been deepened to about 24 feet and shipping companies began calling for um, a newer, deeper lock as the vessels had a capability of operating with deeper and deeper drafts. So this project received a boost when the U.S. was drawn into World War II and maintaining a steady supply of iron ore to steel mills became a matter of national security. So this construction of this new lock to play, replace that lethal lock was approved in March 1942 and construction on this one was completed in less than two years. And then vessel sizes continued to increase and began to push the limits of even the MacArthur lock by the 1950s. So to meet a growing demand for larger and larger vessels, planning began in 1958 for a larger and deeper lock to replace that 60 plus year old Poe lock. The completed plans called for a lock 1,000 feet long and 100 feet wide and construction began in 1961. But fairly quickly into the project, um, it became clear that uh, even larger lock would be needed. Um, and the lock was redesigned to its current dimensions of 1,200 by 110 feet. And the lock began operating in 1968, and in less than four years, it would lock through the first 1,000-foot-long vessel on the Great Lakes. And the Corps of Engineers still really works closely with the shipping industry to sh ensure specifications of our projects meet current ship and other maritime trends. So we kind of come up into a period where there's just kind of a lot of legislation and things happening. By 1972, the Davis and Sabin were both over 50 years old and nearing the end of their useful economic lives. Um, given that they could only handle 21 feet in draft, um, only older boats used them with any regularity. And I found this um, story from the New York Times about a moose invading the Sioux locks um, back in uh, September of 1972. And then as I was sharing this with some members of the team, they, they told me that this maybe happens regularly there. So that's just a couple of years ago on the Canadian side, there was a, a similar situation with a moose swimming through the, through the river. But in uh, February of 1972, the Detroit engineer was given the approval by the chief of engineers to conduct a study considering whether to replace one or more of the locks of the Sioux. So despite this early progress, as early as 1972. It was a lot of years later when construction of a new lock on the site of the Davis and Sabin lock, um, a lock the same size as the Poe, was actually authorized by the Water Resources Development Act of 1986, but funding for the project still wasn't committed. So why a second Poe sized lock? And many of you watching may know this, but I think it's important to keep hammering away at the importance of this new lock. 10% of our nation's waterborne domestic traffic is transported on the Great Lakes navigation system, and half of that traffic goes through the Sioux locks. There's only two operational locks at the facility right now, the MacArthur lock and the Poe lock. And the MacArthur lock, which was constructed in 43, is only 80 feet wide by 800 feet long. The Poe lock is 110 feet wide by 1,200 feet long. The Polak is the only lock at the Sioux capable of locking our 1,000-foot vessels 
and 90% of the tonnage passing through the facility is restricted at going through this pole lock. That makes this one 52-year-old lock, which had a 50-year design, the potential single point of failure of our nation's supply of iron ore from the iron ore mines from the western shore of Lake Superior down to the steel mills along the southern shores of the lower Great Lakes. This is an issue because nearly all domestically produced high strength steel is made with iron ore that transits the Polak. The new lock being built will ensure that commodities through the lock keep our country strong through manufacturing. And the fuel economy of maritime transportation is significantly higher than any form of ground transportation. For example, a Great Lakes carrier averages 631 miles on one gallon of fuel per ton of cargo. In contrast, a truck averages 91 miles on one gallon of fuel per ton of cargo, and a freight train only 553 miles on one gallon of fuel per ton of cargo. In one delivery, a 1,000-foot Great Lakes carrier supplies 70,000 tons of cargo, and it would take nearly 3,000 semi-truck loads to haul the same load. Mode of transportation is not only much less fuel efficient, it creates significant wear and tear on the nation's infrastructure and increases congestion on our already clogged roadway arteries. It's estimated that within a two to six weeks of an unscheduled closure of the Polak, 75% of our nation's high strength steel production would cease. And this would in turn impact automobile appliance and heavy equipment manufacturing across the country. A six month unscheduled closure of the Polak would result in about 11 million people being out of work. So com for comparison, back in 2009, um, we saw high rates of unemployment along the West Coast, in the Southeast and in the Midwest as shown in the bottom figure. A six month closure of the Po would result in exceptionally high unemployment rates in the Great Lakes states and in the South where those factories are. So that being said, ensuring reliability of the Sioux locks is critical. And we're ensuring this reliability by maintaining the existing facility and through construction of this new lock in the same dimensions as the PO to create resiliency and redundancy. So how did we get here? Lots of work behind the scenes. In 2005, we had a, a reevaluation report that calculated this benefit cost ratio of about 0.73 associated with construction of a second PO size lock. In 2007, the Water Resources Development Act stated that construction of a new lock could be 100% funded by the federal government. And in 2014, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers conducted a partial benefits analysis to determine if some of those uh, benefit categories weren't really captured correctly or were insufficient information. And due to the results of that analysis, the Corps of Engineers decided that an economic reevaluation was needed. This Economic validation study was completed in 2018, and the Water Resources Development Act of 2018 authorized the project at a cost of $922 million. So what is a mega project? Sometimes we hear the uh, new loss referred to as a mega project. Um, a mega project, according to the Oxford Handbook of uh, Mega Project Management, says that mega projects are large scale complex ventures that typically cost $1 billion or more. They take several years to develop and build, and they involve multiple public and private stakeholders. They're transformational and they impact millions of people. So, other mega projects that you may be aware of are like the F 22 or the uh, Hubble Telescope, the Space Shuttle, um, also many major highways and byway projects that we see in, in large cities. Um, and even hosting an Olympics is close to a billion dollars for a city. I'm getting to the team and the project, that we have a, a really skilled team formed for this project that will oversee all aspects of the work. So we've got engineers, contracting representatives, communication specialists, and others that are all involved in the planning and the overseeing, the coordination and the publicizing of the project. These professionals are actually spread out through the United States with really the very best of the best of the best of the Corps of Engineers working on this project 
from locations like Louisville, Huntington, Nashville, Detroit, and Sault Ste. Marie. So we'll begin to get into the nuts and bolts of the new lock project. The remaining work for the new lock is broken into three phases. You might all often hear of us talk about phase one, phase two, or phase three, and how we kind of keep it all segmented and, and little teams working on different parts of the project. Phase one is the upstream channel deepening. So this work is shown in pink, and it consists of deepening the 6,000 foot long approach channel to the new lock um, all the way to a depth of 30 feet. Um, this has been awarded, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The construction has started on this channel deepening. Phase two is the upstream approach wall, and this work is shown in yellow. It consists of rehabilitating the approach walls upstream of the new lock. And we have just um, advertised, solicited this construction contract, and they're in the process of evaluating those proposals. Phase three is the new lock chamber. Um, this work is shown in blue in the figure here, and it consists of construction of that 1,200 foot long, 110 foot wide, 32 foot deep chamber, and the downstream approach walls to the new lock. And this design is in progress. We reached our 70% design milestone uh, just this month. And anyone who's familiar with the lock will always needs to ask, how are we gonna have more than one contractor working on the lock at, at the same time? So we've put together this graphic just to kind of illustrate those three phases and why it's so important that we stay on track with efficient funding um, and timing as we work um, through this. Uh, the work really does need to overlap and be accomplished in a certain order. So a delay to phase one would impact phase two and so on and so on. So in 2020, this upstream channel deepening contractor it's working on the uh, sensor area shown in the image, the, um, deepening to the full width of the channel. They will start on the east end and work westward. So they'll start here in the pink and work westward. And then that makes room for the upstream approach raw contractor to come in and start then in the same area in the east and work um, kind of behind that channel deepening project, which then allows for the chamber to come in and be able to uh, begin work in this regard. So if all goes as planned, in 2022, when the chamber contractor arrives on site, which is kind of our, our, um, our goal date, um, then we'll be able to uh, move forward and uh, just be able to focus on that work altogether. So moving into just a little more details of each of the phases. This first phase of construction, this upstream channel deepening, again, to a depth of 30 feet. There's a 6,000 foot approach um, channel, and it's currently not deep enough for modern vessels. Um, some of the bedrock is as high as 25 uh, feet um, below low water datum in these areas. So the figure on this slide shows kind of that scope of work. The blue line in the image denotes the, um, the limits or kind of the uh, parameters of this channel deepening. And then we'll be deepening the channel to that 30 feet everywhere within this 30, uh, this blue line. This contract um, with Trade West involves the removal of both bedrock and overburden material, which is the loose material that's kind of just settled down to the bottom. The green area shown here is uh, where only overburden removal is required. And you'll notice that there is an area within the blue outline that's not shaded and this area is already 30 feet deep or greater. The hardness of the bedrock, it's uh, Jacobsville sandstone, varies across the approach channel and the contractor um, will decide on where the material will be mechanically removed. Um, at this time, that's what they're doing, so mechanically removed it. First, we didn't know if it would have to be blasted or not. And then this red area is where that um, overburden and bedrock will be um, so we'll move it from the channel and then push it over here to the northwest up here. So this is actually a video, um, the upstream channel deepening again, awarded to Trade West in January. They're out of Nevada. And they have a team of about, well, probably less than 20 people working on this phase. Um, 
they've mobilized equipment to the site on May 4th, and that was a very exciting day for us. And I want to see if this will show for you guys. So again, this is the equipment being mobilized, moved in on a barge through the lock, and then over towards that uh, Northwest Pier. And the dredging activity has started. They're currently working on the west end of the approach channel, removing the overburden, um, which if you're in the Sioux, you might be able to see this activity happening from West Portage Avenue or even the West Pier Place apartment area. Um, and then after July 4th, we'll be moving to the far eastern end of the project to start with bedrock removal there. So just a little bit more time to see this overburden being removed from the western edge. And again, this uh, material is being placed on the Northwest Pier, which is a um, core property and located directly adjacent to the deep sea area. The material removed to the, from the channel will be placed to a maximum height of 84 feet, which is about half the height of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and will actually provide a windbreak for vessels, which is a, is a positive thing. And it's anticipated the, the uh, 300,000 cubic yards of material will be removed and placed up there on the pier, which would be about 200 million hockey pucks if you were to stack them all up. The second phase of the project is uh, the rehabilitation of the upstream approach walls. So the approach walls are being rehabilitated using several different methods. We'll be installing about 1,500 linear feet of 34 foot diameter steel sheet piles shown in blue. A thousand feet of steel sheet pile transition walls is shown in orange. 1100 feet of steel sheet pile face wall as shown in blue dashed line. And 1100 linear feet of concrete faced H pile wall as shown in green. So this design is complete. As I said, we've already advertised it. We're currently in source selection and we're looking at this being awarded before the end of the fiscal year. So just really moving right along on the project. And then the third phase is the new lock chamber, which just like the pole will be 110 foot wide, 1200 feet long, and 33 feet deep. The new lock will be constructed within the footprint of the Sabin uh, chamber. And the north wall of the new lock chamber will be in the same location as the existing north wall of the chamber. And it will be 30 feet wider, nine feet deeper, and 150 feet shorter than the Saban lock chamber. So we have a lot of really, um, with, with all of our uh, design team engineers, project managers being in different locations, they're using things like um, 3D modeling so that as they work on one portion of it, it can come together with another portion of the project, maybe from another location. So we've been um, having some really cool pictures and I'm gonna show you this 3D video. This is of the new lock chamber. Um, and we'll, we'll just kind of take a, a fly through this. Um, this side actually, the side closest to, uh, probably shown on your left, is the north side actually. And we can see that um, we've got the control houses, the one with the bump out will actually be for the uh, lock masters. We've got the uh, gate, ship arresters, some high mass lighting. Going through, you see the culvert valves, the laterals. And then moving downstream, the same, you see the uh, laterals. Again, ship arresters. This is the birdhouse looking thing is an electrical 
um, housing. And again, the miter gate, this is a lock. And then the blue is the new Davis pump well that's used for um, dewatering the lock when we have maintenance. So the biggest vessels that come in are um, over 90,000 tons, and they travel about two and a half miles per hour when they come into the facility. And the chamber can fill in about 15 to 20 minutes, but um, getting to the chamber, um, getting above and below and through, takes about an hour and a half to two hours. And this new lock chamber, um, it will be as long as the Empire State Building is tall. It's almost as deep as a standard telephone pole. A standard telephone pole is uh, 36 feet, so this will be 32 feet. And if you filled it, you could fill it um, with as much as 2 million kegs of beer or 800,000 bathtubs full of water. The funding history and capabilities, we won't, I won't go really in depth at this. So far we've received $241.6 million for the project. This is 25% of the total project cost. In FY19, the project received nearly $70 million, which allowed for us to complete the design of the upstream channel deepening and allowed for us to press forward with award for construction for the upstream channel deepening. And then funds provided by the state of Michigan allows for us to proceed with the design of the approach walls and the design of the chamber during 2019. So that really pushed us along a, a little bit quicker than we might have anticipated. And then this year in fiscal year 2020, we've received $75.3 million appropriated, which included funds for the upstream channel deepening, the fully fund construction and one year of construction management. Also, the upstream approach walls construction was partially funded, and the new lock chamber design was funded. So our FY20 work plan funds from the core were to a total of $50 million. The new lock in total is estimated to cost just over $1 billion. It's estimated that construction will take seven to 10 years and that the project will use more than 735,000 tons of domestically quarried limestone, 35,000 tons of American-made cement, and 20,000 tons of American-made steel. Based on our latest regional economic modeling estimate at the peak of construction, so probably between um, um, phase two and three when we have a lot of a lot more construction workers on site. Um, the new lock uh, will support about 1,200 jobs on an annual basis. And this annual job estimate really is broken down into three different categories. The 600 direct jobs, so those are um, those actual construction workers that would be on site and management of construction. 210 um, indirect jobs, so that would be industry supplied goods, um, services and support of those direct jobs. Um, people making concrete and rebar, and then 430 induced jobs. So those are the jobs that will support those working on the project in, in the community, um, people like hotel workers, restaurant workers, and that sort of thing. And finally, I'm asked all the time, renaming the lock. Um, there isn't currently a name of the new lock, so you might hear it referred to as the new lock at the Sioux, or even the third lock with the um, MacArthur lock and the Pollock and the other two. But eventually Congress will pass an act to name the new lock. And we aren't certain of their timeline for this, but all previous names for the area locks were selected after the lock became operational. So that's the information that I have to share with you today. And I know we'll open it up to questions, which if I'm not able to answer them, again, I'm not a designer or an engineer, I would um, I will write it down and make sure I get you that information. Also, um, please ask your questions because it's kind of like I'm not being able to see the forest or the trees. Um, we're so close to the project that we're not really familiar with you. There's something else that you, some tidbit of information that you're interested in, please, please let us know. Thank you, Penny. 
Uh, we'll give you a couple minutes to uh, type in your questions in the chat. Meanwhile, thank you for joining us. And um, I will just do a quick update while you're typing in those questions. Uh, right now, our visitor centers remain closed, but um, at the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center, they are around to announcing vessel arrivals and departures. There is a cell tour, a cell phone tour available outdoors, and they're going to begin having outdoor guest services July 1st. Um, at the Sioux, we have exhibits installed in our park, which is open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, we have uh, front desk attendants who are announcing vessel arrivals, and we are providing outdoor guest services on the north porch of our visitor center, which is what you can see in that photo there on the left. And um, I will uh, start going through some of these questions that we've got. One of the and early the questions. I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say I'm seeing I'm seeing a bunch about you know that might take more of a designer, but go ahead and go through them, and then we can uh, we can pick through these together. Okay. Um, someone was asking, what is a soldier wall? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I could go ahead and Google it, but I would. I want to make sure that it's uh, uh, pertinent to our project. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just write that one down for um, for future explanation. I'm sorry I'm not able to answer that one. OK. Um, and someone was asking, what are the culverts, the valves, the laterals, the arresters? Right, so the ship arresters are sort of like um, kind of speed bumps. They're going to hold that, hold that ship so that it doesn't um, move back and forth or go too fast, doesn't hit the walls. Um, we are, the Sioux Locks is the only project in uh, the Corps of Engineers, the only locks in the Corps of Engineers that actually has ship arresters, and it's because the ships that come through our locks are so big, we want to make sure that they don't damage anything further or, you know, kind of swoosh ahead and, and hit those miter gates. So they kind of hold it in place. The culverts and valves and laterals, the laterals are in the, um, it's all in the lock chamber itself. The valves will either open up the uh, open up the water in the culvert to, to come into the chamber, which would fill it up, or it will um, close them off, which would take the water out through those culverts. So there's actually like culverts in the walls of the chamber, like little tubes, just like you would have in your ditch out in the front yard. And that's where the water flows in and out of. And then it comes in through those, um, we saw kind of those ditches in the uh, bottom of the lock chamber. And uh, I'm just going to give a little teaser here. On July 9th, when I do the winter work presentation, I will be having pictures of all those things and a little bit of a um, tour of some of those features. Um, another question we had is, what are the empty lock dimensions from the sidewalk to the floor, the depth over the sills, et cetera? Right. I don't have the depth over the sills in front of me. And again, the empty lock dimensions. Um, as we keep saying, the 1,200 feet long, 32 feet deep, and uh, 110 feet wide. Um, I uh, For the pole lock, um, the depth over the sills is 32 feet. The sills are the high point within the lock. And then there are debris pits um, beside the sills, which are about six feet lower. So at high pool, you're looking at about 40 feet. Um, a, a ballpark figure, though, if you were standing on the sidewalk and you were uh, going to throw a, a ping pong ball down in the bottom, it's going to go almost 60 feet until it hits the bottom and bounces. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Um, the next question, once the new lock is complete, what will the percentage of tonnage be between the Poe and the new lock? I presume it won't be 50-50. Yeah, I would presume it wouldn't be either, but I don't know that that's really determined just yet. Um, there's different features that might be on this new lock. Uh, some of the things that they're talking about, like hands-free mooring, that might make it um, something that's more interesting to ship captains to go through, but I'm sure that, the, uh, that they'll navigate through both the locks and use uh, both locks similarly. I also know that with this, construction of the new lock, they're also um, restoring the pole lock and doing a lot of um, upgrades to it. Uh, maybe Michelle would know more of, or I think there's been a, you're going to do a program on the restoration. I'm not sure if you are or not. So some of the things like what I just mentioned, if we end up doing something like 
extreme warring on the one side, maybe eventually it will come to the other side. You know, one of the, my program's going to be about winter work, which is the lock, mm -hmm. the work we do on the pole lock when we're closed for the season. And I would anticipate once there is a second pole size lock, um, winter work will probably still be a thing. But uh, sometimes I think there will be more of these projects done in more temperate weather uh, <laughs> because there will be an alternative. So uh, that will that will also probably impact whether the cargoes are split 50-50 or not because they may end up taking one of the locks out during the regular navigation season uh, when you have some decent weather to get this work done. Right. Um, before I move on to some more of these questions, in the chat, I'm going to post the link to the web page um, on our Detroit District website that has all of the new lock information. So that has all of the documents, old and new, about this new project. So um, feel free to copy and paste that and, uh, and visit that for more information. Uh, will construction be year round? If not, how long is the season? That will be determined by the weather. Um, I think that different contractors will look at, at at different proposals, and so we'll just have to kind of see what comes in with the different phases. I've heard a, a little bit of both. So um, depending on if it's a mild winter or not, that might allude to or, or allow for that full season, which will be awesome, right, for our timeline. But I think a lot of it has to do with Mother Nature, and, and that's pretty difficult to uh, speculate on. Um, someone else has asked uh, more of an admin question. If we want to see this again, where do we go on YouTube and when? Um, I My goal is to have this posted to uh, the Detroit District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, YouTube channel by the end of the day today. If not, it'll be on by the end of the day tomorrow. So just check uh, YouTube Detroit District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Or if you follow us on Facebook, it'll be posted there on Facebook, which is also Detroit District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And it will also be on the Sioux Locks Visitor Center Association Facebook page. So uh, plenty of routes to access that. Um, we have another question here. Are the record high water levels in the Great Lakes having any effect on this project? No. I haven't heard anything about high water levels affecting this project. Okay. And any more questions? Well, I will go ahead and uh, run through this conclusion slide. Again, we have another program tomorrow. Um, we have a survey that is there on this page, and we invite everyone to uh, go ahead and fill that out. I am posting a link to the survey in the chat, so you can just click on that link to fill out the survey. That helps us plan future programs and to know if this one is effective. And we're also very interested in where people are uh, tuning in from, and we appreciate it. Um, next week, uh, Hidden Shipwrecks of the Twin Ports. Uh, on this uh, slide, you'll also see all of the various contact information. And these are also where our video of the program will be posted later today.